Seattle University head coach Chris Victor joins the show today to tell us why his program could be a sleeping giant out west. You are Locked On College Basketball, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is up? Welcome to the Locked On College Basketball Podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I am your host, Andy Patton, and thrilled to be joined today by Chris Victor, now in his first full season as the head coach at Seattle University, following an extremely successful stint as interim head coach last season, where the Red Hawks went 23-9, and tied for first in the Western Athletic Conference, Coach obviously taking home WAC Coach of the Year honors with that interim tag. Pretty impressive stuff. Uh, before we start talking about this year's team and, and the successful start that you guys have had, I kind of want to start with last year and what that process was like kind of taking over a team right before the season started and kind of how how it went to kind of get the guys motivated and keep them going despite kind of a some turmoil right at the beginning of the year. Yeah, well, first of all, thanks for having me on, Andy. Yeah. Really appreciate it. Great being here. Um yeah, last year was it was a unique start. You know, we um, had a coaching transition three days before the first game. Um, you know, I was named interim head coach on a Sunday. First game was on a Wednesday and didn't have much time. We got right into it. Uh, you know, and anytime you have a, a successful season, you want to look back on and figure out, mm-hmm. you know, what made us, what, what allowed us to win some games. And we had some really good players on that team last year. Uh, mm-hmm. A lot of re- return to this team this year. And when you have good players that, um, are all about winning, all about the team. Mm-hmm. They they enjoy competing with each other. You got a chance to be pretty good. So I think overall we had a, we had a high character locker room with a bunch of guys that th- the program and winning meant a lot to them. Um, with with some talented guys, and we were able to you know get better throughout the season and and ultimately have a year that's that's um, you know it's one of the best Seattle U's had in a while. Mm-hmm. Well, I kind of want to talk about Seattle U as a whole, because I, I've always felt, and maybe I'm a little biased uh, as somebody who went to grad school there, but I've always felt that Seattle U is a little bit of a sleeping giant. You know, we're talking about a program that obviously has had some historical success. It was a very long time ago, uh, but still a program that has NBA Hall of Famers who've come from the program, located in a giant basketball starved city, uh, yeah. you know, a, a city that obviously they have University of Washington, but doesn't have a ton of other basketball ton of fantastic high school basketball and we've seen incredible amount of high level talent in this program a few players who have moved on like Terrell Brown who I think led the Pac-12 in scoring uh, Darian Trammell who's having a lot of success at San Diego State of course Cameron Tyson who's been one of the best mid-major guards in the entire country the last couple of years a program that is on the cusp of making the NCAA tournament I'd kind of love to hear your thoughts on, on what makes Seattle U such a, a strong place to, to play basketball and a, a a program that's kind of on the rise and of course how critical making the big dance is towards moving that program up in that direction. Yeah. You know, the, your, the storied history is, is special, but well, that yeah. was back in the fifties and sixties, you know, Elder mm-hmm. Baylor mm-hmm. Um, playing, playing in championship games, final fours. Um, you know, and then, you know, Seattle, you dropped their athletics all the way down to the NAI for a while. And we're yeah. just kind of been back to vision one now for 12 or 13 years, building it back up. And mm-hmm. I agree, you know, it's a, the university itself, um, such a such a great education, such a high level university on the academic side. Mm-hmm. We're in downtown Seattle, um, which is an unbelievable sports city, yeah. let alone basketball. Just overall, a great sports city. With you're right. I mean, the talent, the high school talent that's come from the city of Seattle is underrated nationally. Mm-hmm. No question about it. And this program, we're starting to build that way. You know, we had a great year last year, um, off to a good start this season. You know, really trying to attract some of those, some of that talent we talked about from Seattle to stay here or come home, like Cam Tyson has done with with great success. Mm-hmm. And yeah, we, we're continuing to build. And obviously, for us as, as a college basketball program that hasn't been to the tournament in a while, that that's a goal of ours. Mm-hmm. Uh, but just to continue to get better, continue to improve, and work towards that as well. You know, last year was a big jump for us, and hopefully this year we can continue that success and keep moving the program forward with. The ultimate goal of getting the March Madness, you know, dancing when that when that went on on Selection Sunday, but you know we're excited where we're at, um, and just really trying to 
trying to continue to improve this program. Cause you're right. I think there's, there's some special things ahead here. Um, and we're trying to, we're, we're trying to work that way. One thing that I've always wanted to talk to, to coaches about is something that I'm really passionate about uh, at the mid-major level in particular is just the, the challenges of scheduling. And I know obviously pretty new in the head coaching realm. So I, I know that the, the scheduling aspects, you know, I know obviously there, there could be elements of that that were done as an assistant coach as well. But I look at, I, I'm a Gonzaga fan. I have been rooting for Gonzaga for over a decade. And the amount of time it took for Gonzaga to finally be able to start scheduling high level programs that are willing to come to Spokane and even you know a coach who will remain nameless who's willing to come to Spokane but not quite willing to come all the way to the kennel and play at their home arena even now uh, when this program is at the level that they're at we've seen St. Mary's struggle to kind of schedule some of those high profile teams uh, and, and we just had a recent conversation on this podcast about how many of the power five programs or conferences are starting to schedule starting their conference season really early I think USC and Cal played on November 30th. So we're talking about conference games happening in November. I wonder just what the process is like trying to schedule and trying to get some of those high profile games. Obviously, the relationship with the University of Washington is a, is a beneficial one and the opportunity to play a, a high level program. I know you guys have Oregon State on the schedule as well, but what is it kind of what goes into trying to put that schedule together and trying to find the, the most competitive schedule that you can? And how much of a barrier is there with some of those high profile programs? Yeah, scheduling is is, is huge. I mean, you're, you're, you're spot on. It's um, if you want to elevate your program and continue to move forward, scheduling is a big piece to that. We all know how important recruiting is, um, but scheduling is right there as well. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, different universities have different requirements for scheduling, whether it's raising money for the university or, right. you know, some of your net ranking goals or, you know, kind of what you want to get out of the non-conference. So for us, we definitely want to start elevating mm -hmm. our schedule. Um, you know, this year we're, we're in the Diamond Head Classic, which is going to be great for us. We're playing a Utah State team in the first yeah. round who's undefeated at this point. Fantastic. One of the best teams in the country moving forward. It's a great game for us on national TV. Just games like that. You're right, playing University of Washington. We have a bunch mm -hmm. of regional matchups with University of Portland, who's having a great year, and Oregon yeah. State. Portland State we played this year. So as we move forward, we would love to have some more of those high-profile games. Um, next year we're going to be hosting UW at Climate Pledge Arena, which is going to be a great game for us. And the more we can get those and be on the Pac-12 network, um, keeping our regional matchups, but also having some some national matchups against some programs, whether it's a strong mid-major programs or even some high major power five games is going to help us. So as we move forward, we would love to kind of add one or two of those a year. Um, and being the diamond head this year is going to help. And it's just being able to play on national TV and against those programs is something that we want to work towards. But you're right. It's a you work on – we recruit all, all year, work on scheduling all year. It's something that's nonstop. And um, we're currently trying to build next year's schedule out mm -hmm. uh, with all these, all these ideas in mind. Yeah, you know, as I mentioned before we started recording, I spoke with Coach Shante Leggins at Portland, and obviously their ability to be a part of the Phil Knight Invitational this year and get a chance to play against teams like North Carolina and Villanova and Michigan State and play extraordinarily well against those three teams and really elevate their program like that. That's the kind of stuff that they're very fortunate to be in an opportunity to play in that, but the Diamond Head, similar opportunity there. So it's good to see those kind of MTEs come together in a way for, for programs like Seattle U, like UP to, to get into those, uh, those kind of opportunities, those games that maybe they wouldn't get to, to, to do otherwise. Yeah. I mean, and you've seen, you know, it's going to be hard for us to get some, some, some home games in Seattle against those programs, yeah. but you've seen yeah. some, you, you've seen some creativity in scheduling. You see a lot of these mid majors now meeting at neutral sites, yes. playing at Salt Lake city college the last couple of years, Santa Clara, you know, some mm -hmm. of those hot, Team. So they're, they're, we can get a little creative if we need to, maybe maybe not the home game we want, um, mm -hmm. but to be able to be willing to play some of those games as well. Well, yeah. Seattle University is in the continually improving Western Athletic Conference. Hear Coach Victor's thoughts on his opponents and how the transfer portal has impacted him as a new head coach. But before we get there, a word from today's sponsor, LinkedIn. These days, every new potential hire can feel like a high stakes wager for your small business. You want to be 100% certain that you have access to the best qualified candidates available. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the right people to hire for your team faster and for free. It's extremely simple to use. Start by adding your job and the purple hashtag hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile to spread the word that you're hiring. Simple tools like screening questions make it easy to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience so you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and hire. 
It's why small businesses rate LinkedIn Jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. That's linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. Well, switching over from non-conference into conference, uh, the Seattle U program was 14 and four in WAC play last year. I was a conference that was very, very top heavy. I was doing a little research. Five teams uh, posted a conference win percentage over 70% last year. It uh, looks like we're going to be in a similar spot again this year with a lot of really solid teams at the top. Of course, New Mexico State has kind of been the, the program to beat in this conference for a long time. Even with the coaching change, they still look very solid. Grand Canyon, Cal Baptist has one of the best mid-major guards in the entire country uh, on their program. The WAC is not a conference that tends to get a ton of love uh, outside of kind of people who are really into mid-major basketball, but it certainly looks to me like a program or a conference that is really on the rise uh, basketball-wise. I'd love to hear your thoughts on just the quality of basketball in that conference these days. Yeah, the, the WAC will, will be slowly mm-hmm. being recognized as one of the best conferences in the mid-major conferences yep. in the country. It's it's very good this year. Um, it was great last year. Mm-hmm. Um there's teams that are all teams that have been returning this year. You know, you, you mentioned a handful of them. You also haven't mentioned Sam Houston State, who's yeah. currently already already won two two quad one road wins mm-hmm. early in the season. Yeah, um, this conference is very very good. And you know, mm-hmm. five years ago, six years ago, I understand the whack mm-hmm. it wasn't. And but since then, we've been building. And the teams that we added last year: Stephen F. Austin, Abilene Christian, Sam Houston. You add those to Grand Canyon, New Mexico State, Cal Baptist, Utah Valley. It is a deep, talented conference. Tarleton had been playing teams tough early in the season. And, Mm -hmm. um, you know, this is a conference that as the season progresses, especially in our conference, I'm not going to be surprised when you see a couple more big power five wins from this conference as well. Um, Cal Baptist went up to University of Washington. There's there's a lot of examples already early in the season. There's going to be more throughout December as well. And then you get into conference and you understand – just the, the grind it's going to be traveling, especially for us in Seattle, having to travel to Texas multiple times. Yeah. We're kind of the geographic outlier in the mm-hmm. conference, making it a little more difficult, but mm-hmm. it's a tough, it's a tough conference with a lot of great coaches, a ton of great players, and just some programs that have, you know, had such success. You talk about Abilene Christian two years ago, going to the NCAA tournament being Texas. Yeah. We had a great team last year, won t- over 20 games. They returned a lot of people. There's just so, so many, so many talented programs. And I think, the more the games that we win in the non-conference, the people are going to start to understand um, how talented this WAC, this, uh, WAC conference is. Yeah, it's, it's funny. Uh, I think part of the, the situation with the WAC that makes it a little harder for it to get recognition is just how much turnover there has been in the last five or six years. So many teams that are leaving and coming and going, and, and every year it seems like there's at least one or two different changes. Uh, but obviously, so many of those additions, like you mentioned, Stephen F. Austin, Sam Houston, ha- have been very positive. Grand Canyon, a fairly recent addition, they've been outstanding as well. So it seems like the conference is continuing to move towards adding the as as high profile of programs as they possibly can. One kind of question I wanted to ask about that too is: you have a lot of programs that have very different styles. You know, you Tarleton plays this really kind of aggressive, physical style, grinded out games. You have some teams that are, are more up tempo, getting out in transition. And I wonder what it's like just on a game to game basis to prepare for teams that really kind of run the gamut of different styles of basketball, and, and how tough it is to obviously have more extensive travel than many of the other teams in the conference, which is no doubt a barrier. And then also having this like, Hey, we're turning it around in two days and we're going to play a basically brand different brand of basketball two days from now in order to, to secure a victory over this team. Yeah. I mean, adding those, adding those Texas schools uh, Mm -hmm. brought a unique style. You know, you have Stephen F. Austin, Tarleton, (laughs) Abilene um, and Sam Houston, who any given year could lead the country in turnover percentage, force yeah. turnover percentage. So, you know, you have Stephen F. Austin, all, all those teams that play that style of tough, physical pressure uh, defense, which was new to us. You know, it was New Mexico State. Well, this is a this is a very defensive conference. It's a tough conference. It's a conference where you, if you look at the, some of the rankings that Grand Canyon is always a great defensive team, big and physical. But you're right. Then you play some unique styles. Cal mm-hmm. Baptist is you know, very talented offensive team who's been very good defensively this year as well. Yeah. But, you know, a little more open style, playing a little slower pace. Mm-hmm. So, yes, yeah, game to game, Utah Valley's a big physical team, plays a little slower. So, you know, game to game, um, 
the styles might change, right? Which makes it tough kind of jumping back and forth on a Thursday, Saturday road trip or, or, you know, teams that come home at totally different styles, but Mm -hmm. um, it's a great test for us. It's allowed, you know, it's allowed us to play different styles throughout the season. It also forces us in our non-conference to try and schedule some games where we will face some pressure, face, uh, face some teams that play at a faster pace just so to get ready for that comp- those conference games. But um, yeah, it's a, it's, it's definitely with the travel and the style of play, you can play a very unique Thursday, Saturday road yeah. trip, depending on where we're going. Well, Chris, the next thing I want to talk about is, is the biggest change in college basketball in what has been a multiple year stretch of tons of <laughs> significant changes to college basketball. And that is of course the, the transfer portal and the, the way that those rules have been altered and changed. And of course the not having to sit out for a year. And now we're seeing, I think it was close to 1500, if not over 1500 players that were in the transfer portal last year, uh, potentially numbers are going to continue to grow unless there is some changes to those rules. Uh, obviously for Seattle, you've seen some really high profile players move on to higher level programs or power five programs. Uh, also seen some players come into the program. Uh, Paris Dawson has had a solid start to the season, a guy who transferred in from Portland state. So kind of easy to see the pros and cons of the transfer portal uh, as somebody who's relatively new to the head coaching at the division one level. I'm kind of curious how you have found to implement the transfer portal in your kind of workings as a head coach? Yeah, I think like anything, you know, there's definitely some positives, there's some pros and there's some cons. Um, mm-hmm. The transfer portal, I believe, is a lot of people have been focusing on the negatives and mm-hmm. um, and there are some things that need to be worked out with the transfer portal, but there are also some positives. I mean, mm-hmm. we, we don't want to rely on the transfer portal, sure. but it does allow us, you know, some of our, you know, Cameron Tyson was a great, mm-hmm. a great pro from the portal where yeah. he, was at University of Houston, wasn't, had, didn't have the role. Um, he loved the program, loved the staff, didn't have the role that, yeah. that he wanted, um, decided he wanted to come home and mm-hmm. um, wanted to elevate this program and see what he can do. And he's been a, a huge success story from the portal. Paris Dawson is another example. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we love Paris at a high school. Um, yeah. And when he went in the portal, we already knew a lot about him, his family, his background, and we're excited that he chose to come to us. And, you know, some of the negatives when people – you know, when they when we have some student athletes who are in a, a good spot, but they decide they want to kind of jump in the transfer portal mm-hmm. waters and doesn't really work out for them. You get some people that get stuck and yeah, maybe wishing they would have stayed or, you know, mm-hmm. uh, wishing they would have given another chance at the program. But, mm-hmm. you no, know, for us, it's it's we, if if you if you need to fill a spot and you need someone to come in that that, you know, can uh, contribute right away, mm-hmm. uh, the portal of some more will look. Um but yeah, it's one of those things where if you want to focus on the negatives, you can, but there's also been some great positives and great success stories coming out of it as well. Well, the transfer portal, no doubt, has made a huge impact on mid-major programs as well as high-major schools. But one area it has also had a huge impact is with junior college and NAIA recruiting. Coach Victor has an extensive background at both those levels. Hear his insight into how these NCAA changes have impacted that level of hoops. But first, a word from the NHTSA. You're hanging out with some friends and putting back a few drinks. A few becomes a few too many. As the evening comes to an end and people start to head out, you think of calling for a ride. Nah, you live nearby. You can make it home okay. It's not a big deal. What are the odds you'll get pulled over anyway? And even so, what's the worst that could happen? Everyone knows about the risks of driving drunk. The results are tragic and often deadly. However, that still doesn't stop everyone from getting behind the wheel while under the influence. That's why police officers are out there right now looking for impaired drivers on our roads to save lives. So if you think you're okay to drive after a few drinks, think again. Play it safe and plan ahead to get a ride. It only takes one mistake to change your life or someone else's forever. Drive sober or get pulled over. Coming out of it as well. Well, I, I'd like to kind of talk to you. I know, I know you have a background in the junior college level. You have a background at the NIA, NAIA level as a player and as a coach. And those were are two avenues that for a very long time have been utilized by Division One coaches, often at the mid-major level to, to kind of add talent. And certainly that has still been something that CLDU has done in the last couple of years. But I've spoken with a lot of recruiting analysts and, and kind of looking at the the pulse of college basketball right now. And it does seem like that kind of level of recruiting at the junior college NAIA level is, is maybe happening a little bit less as, as coaches are more willing to 
find you know other division one players in the transfer right. portal that they can add without having to sit out a year and so you can understand why coaches may move in that direction as opposed to going towards the NAIA and JUCO level but it's it's kind of a bummer to, to see some of that get lost because you see so many high level players who come through that level and end up bumping themselves up to the division one level and again I know that your program has kind of continued to utilize that route is that something that you're still kind of using as, as, as a way to to bolster the roster and do you see that being something that will kind of maybe the pendulum might swing back in that direction sometime. Uh, no question. And we, you know, just even this, this last recruiting class, um, mm -hmm. junior college transfer division two transfer that have made direct <laughs> impacts on our program. Um, yeah. I, I, I'm a Juco guy. I played a year at California Juco mm -hmm. after high school before I played at Concordia and Irvine and coached junior college this is my first coaching. My first co college coaching job was at a Juco as an mm -hmm. assistant coach for Rick Croy who's now the head coach at Cal Baptist and, Mm -hmm. I coach at Juco for five years. So yeah, that's, and we, we have not just me, but our whole staff has a lot of relationships with some great junior college programs, California and nationally. So we'll continue to recruit that level. Mm -hmm. um, no question about it. And um, yeah, there's a little more, you know, division two transfers. We're seeing a little more at the transfer portal now moving up mm -hmm. to the division one level NAI as well. So we'll continue to, to use our relationships that we have at the, at, you know, at the junior college level and continue to recruit from there. And, um, you know, the portal is a little easier, not easier. The portal allows you to have a, um, allows you to evaluate because they play division one, they play right. division one basketball. You can see the numbers directly. You can see film mm -hmm. against division one programs. Yeah. Um, and we will use the portal, but yeah, no, no doubt about it. We'll continue to recruit the junior college level as well. Yeah. I mean, it, it makes sense that if you have a list of, you know, you just get a list of X number of players, sometimes in the thousands who, who have all played yeah. at this level in many instances, they've played against teams that you have also played against. So you can kind of say like, okay, this guy had this level of production against these teams. And, and I can understand why that would be easier from a talent evaluation standpoint than looking at junior college or NAIA, where obviously there, that is part of the conversation is how, how will this translate when they're moving up a level, when they're playing at the same level, but there's still elements of that that are tough too. You, you know, you'll see guys, you know, like Cam Tyson's a great example of a player who is at, at a, a really solid program in Houston. And it's like, what is that going to look like translating at a different level and at a, you know, at a mid-major program and, you can kind of see how how the transfer portal makes it a little bit easier, but also can can create situations where some of those players maybe get overlooked. Uh, and then, of course, it, it translates over to high school recruiting as well. You know, the 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 hallmark of college basketball for decades has been being able to recruit and evaluate high school talent, and it's still a, a critical piece, no doubt. And and I think the programs so far that have really gone too far away from high school recruiting and only focused on the transfers, I think that that's going to end up being something that that maybe bites those teams uh, later on down the line, because that's just a really tricky way to, to evaluate and, and create a roster. But I do wonder if we're going to see how the high school recruiting, especially when you're not talking about the top 15, 20, even 50 guys, how that might change with this transfer portal being much more accessible for coaches. Yeah. You know, we, I agree. We, we, our, we have two, we had two early commitments in this early recruiting class, both high school mm -hmm. kids that we're really excited about that, uh, we plan on being um, impact players right away for us. Um, and we'll continue to recruit the high school level and continue to use our relationships that we've built. And, you know, anytime you, we, we can get excited, especially about local local high school talent here in Seattle that we would love to keep home and give them in Red Hawk uniform for four years. Um, but, yeah, the, the high school recruitment is a little different now. You're right with the transfer portal. I don't think in many, especially at the mid-major level, as many of these programs are willing to commit scholarships early to high school players. Um and kind of take away their flexibility after the season with the transfer portal, but we'll continue to recruit the high school level. We'll continue to, to evaluate as best we can and, and try and find players that are going to allow us to, to continue to grow this program. You know, for us at the mid-major level, it's still, you know, last year we were, we were a young team, a young roster. We returned seven of our top nine from last year's, um, from last year's roster. And mm -hmm. that, that, that's a big, that's a, that's a big deal for us to get older, to have some continuity within our locker room. Mm -hmm. um, and we want to continue to do that. And when we get players from high school that are true freshmen that enjoy their experience here, that love being in Seattle, love being at Seattle U, uh, we think we can keep them for three or four years. And we, if we can get players like that out of high school that we're excited about, that are excited about being here and that can get, grow older in this program, um, that's important to us. It's important to how we're going to win and how we're going to build this thing. And we'll continue to recruit that level.
Well, Coach, thank you so much for taking time to come out of your day to come onto the podcast. Uh, I, having been to many Seattle U home games uh, in my career uh, and in my life, I, I can tell you how fun they are, I, how exciting of an environment it is, whether it's on campus, whether it's at Climate Pledge Arena. Anybody in the area listening to the podcast who wants to watch some high-level college basketball, highly recommend checking out a Seattle U game. Coach, uh, thank you again. I really appreciate Thanks, it. Thanks, Andy. Appreciate you. Talk to you soon. All right, that is going to do it for us today. Thank you again to Coach Chris Victor for joining us today. Plenty more great content coming your way right here on the Locked On College Basketball Podcast. I also want to thank all of you for making Locked On College Basketball your first listen of the day for your second listen today. Check out the Locked On Sports Today podcast, the biggest stories of the day, plus instant reactions, big game recaps, and the take of the day. Available on the Odyssey app, YouTube, and wherever you get podcasts. All right, folks, enjoy the holidays. Keep checking out Locked On College Basketball. Find us on YouTube. Go hit that subscribe button. And for now, peace out.